Well, welcome to our online worship service this morning, and we're glad that you could join us. Uh, I think at this point, it's been about six weeks since we've been able to gather together in person, and so uh, we're just continuing to miss that. But in the meantime, we want to continue to encourage you to worship the Lord, to join with us as we sing uh, today, and to, to join with our hearts as we hear God's Word and think on God's Word, and we pray that, that God would speak to us as we think on Him. And so this morning, as we uh, turn our hearts and our minds to the Lord, we want to start with Psalm 59. And so if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, turn to Psalm 59, verses 16 through 17, and we'll read that together. Psalm 59, verse 16 says this, But I will sing of your strength and will joyfully proclaim your faithful love in the morning, for you have been a stronghold for me, a refuge in my day of trouble. To you, my strength, I sing praises, because God is my stronghold, my faithful God. And that is our prayer for each one of us today, that we can sing of God's strength, we can have joy singing for Him, knowing that He is our stronghold, He is our refuge in our day of trouble where we find ourselves even now, and that we can sing His praises through any trouble that we may face. And so we're going to be thinking more on that from 1 Peter chapter 1 today, how God wants us to have joy even in trial. But let in the meantime, let's go to the Lord and ask His um, presence and His Spirit to move among us and to bring that up in us today. So let's pray together. Father, we come before You admitting our need for you to be our stronghold today. Lord, we are weak vessels. We acknowledge that the troubles and the trials that we are going through are sometimes almost too much for us to bear. And yet, Lord, we know that you are the refuge. You are the stronghold that we can run to, that we can have joy in, and that we can praise even in the midst of our deepest struggles, our hardest trials. God, you are a refuge who will never fail us, who, ha who gives us reason to have joy. And so, Father, I pray that you would plant that deep in our hearts today, that we would know this reality in our own lives, that we would know joy even in trial, that we would know your great love for us. And that love, that joy would override anything else. So I pray that for us this day. Speak to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome. Safe Harbor Baptist Fellowship. Uh, we miss you guys being here in person, but uh, we're praying and trusting the Lord that he's going to bring us together again real soon, uh, Lord willing. So let's worship together this morning with This Is Amazing Grace. Darkness, we love is mighty, and so 
that you've done for me Our scripture reading is from 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 6. Hear God speak through his perfect and holy word this morning. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 6. You rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which, though perishable, is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him, and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that would come to you searched and carefully investigated. They inquired into what time or what circumstances the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating when he testified in advance to the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. These things have now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Angels long to 
catch a glimpse of these things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to feel the weight of this passage. That when we go through these trials, it is not something to beat us down and to keep us down, but to actually enliven us because of the truth that we know from Your Word. That Jesus came and lived a perfect life and suffered and died on a cross for the sins of the world. Now we have a hope that we know to be true that angels long for. That the prophets longed for. And we see it here clearly in Scripture. It has happened. Jesus has come to save His church. Lord, move this morning by the power of Your Holy Spirit. Change hearts. Enliven the spirit of those who know You already. Let people hear this as truth. More true than anything they see in the world around them. Your word. Your truth. Your eternal truths. We love you, Lord, because you first loved us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, praise God. We're going to continue to worship Him and to sing to Him. Uh, no sweeter name. And I hope you guys realize that we're actually singing to the Lord God Almighty. We're not performing for you guys. And I hope you're not singing for each other. Although we are edified by that, we are singing to God Almighty, our Creator, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And there's no sweeter name than the name of Jesus. <laughs>
introduced a song last week called There's a Fountain. It's a new version uh, by Shane and Shane. It has a, a nice bridge on it. And uh, I was thinking about uh, Isaiah uh, chapter 1 verse 18 where the Lord says, let's, let's settle this. Uh, Though your sins were scarlet, they will be as white as snow. And though it, they are crimson red, they shall be like wool. Let's, let's worship the Lord for His kindness and His mercy and His grace.
Well, go ahead and leave your Bibles open to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to work our way through uh, verses 6 through 12 of chapter 1 together. Um, And let me just start by highlighting verse 6 um, for us. And it says this, You rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials. And so I want us to think about this idea this morning of the fact that that Peter is telling us that we can rejoice even in suffering grief in trials. And so what in the world does this mean? To be honest, most people, if we really are honest, we don't really have a category for having joy while we are going through suffering, while we are facing deep grief in trials. So, for example, with the coronavirus that we're dealing with right now, we, we can look at people and we can understand why they would have joy after the trial. For example, uh, if they had the coronavirus and they experienced the, the, the suffering of having that virus and the hardship of it, why they would have joy when they became healthy again. Or for those of us who are in the middle of it now, we, we know, hey, we, we can have joy after this pandemic is over. And we can understand that, but we can't understand, most people can't understand or even comprehend having joy in the middle of all that, in the middle of having the virus, that's not joyful. In the middle of being in this pandemic where our lives are turned upside down, that's not joyful. But 1 Peter, in the verses we're looking at today, actually teach something different. 1 Peter teaches us that not only is it possible For us to have joy in the midst of trials, but actually that's what God wants us to have. That's what God desires for us to experience as followers of Jesus. And so in this sermon series we are in the middle of, of standing firm in the grace of God, I want us to to realize that, that standing firm in the grace of God doesn't just mean that we're supposed to just take beating after beating and hardship after hardship and just endure it, and yes, it's going to be miserable, but we can take it. There's actually something more to it than that. That there's actually joy in standing firm in the struggles that we're facing. And so that's our our big idea that I want us to think about in these verses today. I want us to see together, and that is that followers of Jesus can have joy even in the midst of trials. And this is the reality I want you, God wants you, and myself to experience. Verse 6, when he says that you rejoice even in suffering grief and various trials if necessary, I want us to, to first acknowledge Peter isn't trying to ignore or deny or minimize that there are deep sufferings, deep griefs in the trials. He doesn't want us to just blow it off like it's no big deal. Oh, it'll be fine. No, don't worry about it. That's not what Peter's trying to do here. He acknowledges, hey, suffering is real. Hardships and trials are real. But he reminds them. He wants them to to always know and have in the back of their minds, hey, God is still at work. And God has bigger purposes than what you are seeing right now. And there is actually joy for you in those things. And what he says, if, as, if you rejoice in this, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials, is Paul, Peter is highlighting that God sees it as necessary for us. And if God sees it as necessary, then he must have some good that he is doing because God is good. And so we need to cling to this idea. We need to know this idea and hold it in our hearts that, that God is doing good even now. And we can have joy in that. And so as Christians today, when we think about the the trials that we are facing, the trials that other people are facing, we need to make sure that we don't minimize that pain, that we weep with those who weep, as the Bible calls us to. We don't make light of suffering. But in the midst of that, we also need to realize that we need to make much of God, that we need to fix our minds on Him, on His plans, on His goodness, and know that he is working even through suffering. So let's jump in together, First Peter, starting in verse 6, and let's look at how you and I can have this reality, how we can rejoice 
even through suffering and what we need to know. So the first thing we see, the first reason that we can have joy even in trials in our life is that God brings good through trials. And we see that starting in verse 7. Listen, joy happens in our hearts as we see Christ, as we come to know him, and we see some of the good and we realize some of the good that he can be doing even through suffering. So, and these truths that Peter highlights help us to, to wrap our minds around that good. So we see that, first of all, trials strengthen our faith by revealing our hearts and ultimately God using that to mature our faith. So God brings good by revealing our hearts to us so that our faith may grow and mature. Look at verse 7. It says this, So that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which though perishable is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What Peter is wanting us to see here is that responses to the trials that we face in life help us realize if our faith in Jesus is genuine or if it's just lip service. In other words, do we have real faith in Jesus that's being shown true through trials? Or the faith that we say we have in Jesus is being exposed as a falsehood because now that our lives, our worlds are collapsing in some, some way, the faith isn't there. And it also, for those of us who do have real faith in Jesus Christ, Trials help expose areas of weakness that we have that we might need more faith in. And so when we think about this, Peter uses the analogy of gold, about gold being refined. Now when gold is placed in a refinery, what happens is as the gold is heated in in that, that fire, then the impurities in the gold rise to the surface. And then those impurities can be scraped off so that the gold becomes more pure. And, and so we see that that's what trials actually do in our lives. As we go through the fires of trials in our lives, the impurities of our spiritual lives rise to the surface. Our sins become more evident. We can see them. They, they come out in ways that maybe we didn't even know that they were there before. And so we see that sometimes that is not so pretty. So, so bringing that back to uh, what we're dealing with, with the trials of the coronavirus, you know, Some of us are facing a variety of trials right now. Some of us may have some medical issues um, that we're having to put off for a little bit because we can't get treatment, we can't see the doctors because of the limitations that have been placed on us. And that's frustrating. Some of us uh, who are extroverts are facing the trial of not being able to be around people and not being able to to talk and interact with people that that really gives us great joy and and fuels our our souls in, in a sense. Others of us are really struggling with schedule changes. We like routines and our schedules, and we're we're getting our worlds turned upside down. Our schedules are not what they used to be, and we're having to adjust. Some of us feel tied down. Some of us feel like the walls are caving in on on us, and we just need a break from our quarantine crew, if you know what I mean. Uh, The people that are around us all the time, we just need to to have a break. And so all these things are, are different trials that some of us are facing right now. And in the midst of those trials, think about the ways that we're responding to those. Some of us are dealing with a lot of frustration that's just coming out, and we're lashing out in anger from time to time, or we're feeling very very embittered for what we've been dealt. Some of us are dealing with a lot of worry or fear or anxiety about about the situations we find ourselves in and and what's going to happen. Some of us are are tending to blame others politicians or other people, uh, our bosses or people that have influenced our finances in some way. We're, we're just lashing out, blaming the people who've put us in this spot. Well, all these different responses and more can really reveal what's been in our hearts all along. And this is what the trials are doing. They're bringing those things to the surface so that we can actually see some things that we've been harboring, some sinful ideas, sinful thoughts, sinful tendencies that maybe we didn't realize were there until we can see them more clearly. And so we see as God brings us through the the trials, as hard as they are, this is actually God's great love for us, that he would show us these things that are in our hearts 
that are keeping us from him in some way. Maybe they're keeping us from serving him altogether. Maybe we've never really given our lives to, to Jesus because we didn't think that our hearts were that sinful or that bad. But now, through this trial, we see, wow, I, I really do need forgiveness in my life. There's, there's sin that's coming out of my life that's been there all along that is much worse than I could have even imagined. And really, we know, and the Bible tells us that all sin deserves God's punishment. And so we know, wow, either we're going to receive that from God or we're going to put our hope in Jesus who took that for us. And so this is God's love to us. And that as we continue with that analogy of the gold being refined and our lives being refined, I want us to think about the end result. When gold is being refined, the, the goldsmith know that the process is complete and the, the gold is pure because he can see his reflection in it. And friends, that is what God wants for us. God wants our lives to be so refined and so built up in God and, and sin to be so um, minimized and put to death in our lives that we actually begin to see God's reflection in our life, that our lives image him, that we reflect Christ because God is slowly bringing us to become more and more like him and less and less sinful and more and more like the, the holiness and the goodness and the purity of who God is. That is our goal as Christians, and that's what we want. We want to reflect the God who has loved and saved us and done so much for us, extended us mercy and forgiveness. That's what we want to be like. And so we see that trials serve this good purpose in our lives. And so think about your life right now with the coronavirus and the trials we're facing. How have you been responding? What does that say about your faith and where it is right now? And know that God is calling you to trust him more, to put your faith in Jesus and allow him to refine you and change you through this fire of trial. So we see that's one good thing that God is doing, but we also see the end result, the good result that God brings from this trial and, and God revealing our character. Look at verse 7. It says that it may re result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Don't miss this. When verse 7 says this, what it is saying is that God will actually praise you and give you glory and honor because of your refined faith, because of your, the faith that you have shown in Christ. This is the equivalent of, of what Jesus says in Matthew 25 where he says, well done, good and faithful servant. That is what is waiting. That word from God is what is waiting for you as your faith grows in him and you live out that faith, trusting him, allowing God to change your life in ways that honor and glorify him. So in reality, trials can help give us the greatest gift that we could ever have, and that is praise from our God. Receiving praise from the God who saved us and loved us and sent his son and brought us to him because we have endured those trials, and God has used it to strengthen our faith and our lives lived for him. This is what Paul means in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 through 17, when Paul says this, We do not lose heart, for this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And what Paul knew and what Paul wants us to know is that these trials, these light and momentary afflictions, they don't feel light right now, but they are in comparison of what Jesus went through. But they're preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. And part of that weight of glory is hearing from God praise and honor and glory for what we have done for him. And to hear him say, well done. That should make our souls well up to know that we can live in such a way that honors God that he would say that to us and trials can bring us to that point as we look to him and as we know him and so we see that for Christians trials serve to make our eternity with God even that much better and so that's a good thing then we see more good trials actually serve to deepen our love for Jesus did you know that your trial right now can serve to cause you to love Jesus more look at verse 8 Peter references this he says Though you have not seen him, you love him. So Peter is writing to a group of Christians scattered throughout modern-day Turkey. 
And he knows that their faith, the faith of these Christians, wasn't built upon their sight of Jesus. They hadn't ever seen Jesus like Peter had. Peter had walked with Jesus, had seen his crucifixion and his resurrection, but these Christians had not. And yet, they loved him. They had embraced the gospel. They had embraced the good news of what Jesus had done for them, laying down his life for, to bring them to God, his sacrifice for their sin. And they had received forgiveness and new life with God. And as a result, they hadn't seen him, but they loved him. And God had worked in their lives, and he was working even through the trials that they were facing, and their love was deepening. It was growing. And how could that be? How could these Christians have a growing love for Jesus as hard as their lives were? Well, many of us can testify to exactly what they were experiencing. Many of us that are listening to this have experienced trials. We have experienced difficulties in in our lives, and we remember back to those times, and we know We had a deeper sense of God's presence, a deeper walk with the Lord, a deeper reality that he was with us in those hard times that we can't explain. That as we looked to him, as we prayed, as we sought his help, God met us in that place, and it just made our love for him grow that much more because we knew that God was bringing us through it, and he was faithful, and he had something bigger than what we were facing, and he was giving that to us. And so Peter calls it a joy that is inexpressible and full of glory. Peter or Paul called it a peace that surpasses understanding and guards our hearts. And we can't really explain that to people because it's in us, but we know that, that God through Jesus Christ and his presence is alive in us. It's a joy that we can't explain. It's a, a peace that surpasses understanding. And in these trials that we're facing Jesus draws near to us as we draw near to him. And this is a good thing that God does in us that causes us to love him even more. And then we have the joy at the end knowing what it says in verse 9. That because Jesus lives in our lives now and we know his presence, verse 9, because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls, Jesus' presence with us now reminds us that God is in the process of saving us and that he will one day finally save us and deliver our souls to God forever. So there is joy as we think on what God is doing. All these things that we see Peter reflecting on in the midst of trials. There's joy in our growing love for Jesus. Knowing that our love for Jesus can grow even while we face trials because of his faithful presence, his faithful forgiveness and mercy towards us. And little by little, we can know God more, and there's much joy in that. Spurgeon, the great preacher from England, said it like this, little faith brings your soul to heaven, but great faith brings heaven to your soul. And this is what God wants us to experience in the midst of trials, that we would have great faith, knowing that God is doing good, and that would bring God to our souls in deeper and greater ways, and we would experience that taste of heaven. So we see that that God is bringing good from trials, and there is joy in that. But we also see that we can have joy in trials because we can know the Savior who is walking with us in the trials. And that's what we see in verses 10 through 12. We see reflections on who this Savior is that we can know in the midst of trials. As Christians, we know that life is not ultimately left up to chance. And this brings great hope. We know that we don't have to depend on karma or on good luck or on anything else, hoping that life is going to turn out okay. Instead, we know a firm and fixed Savior who is true and real and has already promised what is going to happen, who is with us, and nothing is left to chance. And so that's what we see. First, we see that Peter highlights this Savior from the terms of the Old Testament prophets. We know the one who was the hope of the Old Testament prophets from long ago. Old Testament Israel knew God. They knew God in a sense, but it was from a distance. And they longed for the day when when God would send and reveal the Savior, and they would know the fullness 
of God's mercies towards them. And that's what, let's pick up in verse 10. Let, let's see what they say. Peter says this, concerning this salvation, the one that we have experienced if we're a believer in Christ, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that would come to you searched carefully and they investigated. They longed to understand this salvation. They inquired into what time or what circumstances the spirit of Christ within them was indicating when he testified in advance to the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. They knew that the Savior would suffer in some way. They knew that there would be great glory through that, but they didn't fully understand it. And then verse 12, it says, It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. They were serving those of you who would see it, who would know it. So prophets we see here, didn't, they didn't understand all the details. They knew that God was going to save his people. They understand that God had a plan, that it would involve a, a, a suffering servant. But they didn't know how all that would play out and the result of that. But we today have seen it. We have God's word which testifies to exactly what God has done through Jesus Christ. We know that to, to, for us to know God and to have a relationship with him, God himself had to send his son and leave heaven and suffer and die in our place so that we could be brought back and our sins forgiven. That's the only way that we could share in the blessings and the inheritance that God has for us and that God loved us so much, he did that. He left the glories of heaven for us and laid down his life and suffered for us. And as Christians, we get to experience and rejoice in all that God has done in his great salvation, the salvation the prophets longed to see and understand. We get to see it in his word through his spirit. And we can know God in a personal way that they never could. What joy is there in that, in reflecting on who God is and how he's made it available to all people? So we see that we know this Savior that the Old Testament's long to. We also see that we know this Savior in a deeply personal way through the preaching of the gospel by the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 12. These things have now been announced to you through those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And we have joy in sharing in this experience of God. We have joy in remembering how God allowed for us to hear the good news of Jesus, to hear that we were desperately sinful people separated from him, and yet he came to us to bring us back to him. We remember the joy of, of understanding that for the first time and how the Spirit applied that to our hearts, and we loved God in a new and deeper way knowing that he loved us first and that Jesus is the Savior that we needed. And he now offers to forgive our sins and change our hearts and make us new and help us to not live out the sinful lives that we had been living before, things that promised much joy but left us empty. This reminds me of the, the song in the garden and that line, the hymn, that great hymn where it says, he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And we remember what that was like when we knew that we were God's own through Jesus Christ and the life with him. In Romans 8, Paul says it like this, the spirit testifies to our spirit that we are God's children. In Christ, we know that God has adopted us into his family and that nothing can separate us from his love. And this, this all has happened through the preaching, through us hearing the good news of Jesus and God's Spirit putting that on our hearts, a new love for Him. We can know this Savior personally. He is walking with us. And there's joy in knowing He's alive in our lives. Then we also see that we know this Savior personally, the one that angels longed for. Look at verse 12. Angels long to catch a glimpse of these things. These things are talking about what we know, what we experience as Christians. This conveys the ideas of, of, of angels being in heaven, bending forward, straining forward with, uh, on the edge of their seats with an intense longing to see 
what God is doing and to understand and to see and want to be a part of it. And think about the, the experience of the angels in heaven and all that they have seen and experienced in their lifetimes. They had an opportunity at the beginning of, of creation to see Lucifer, one of the angels, rebel and a third of the angels with him, rebel against God, cast out of heaven, facing God's judgment. Then they saw God create human beings, people made in his own image, and he saw these humans rebel. But then they saw God uh, intervene and come to them and offer them a chance to be redeemed. He had this plan that he was, had in place from the beginning of creation that he was going to redeem sinful humanity even though they didn't re- deserve it at all. And so they watched that plan unfold from heaven. They saw God's plan through Abraham and through the, the nation of Israel. They saw how the nation of Israel continued to sin and disobey God in spite of him coming to them. They saw the, the, the sacrifices that God allowed them to make for their sin to cover it so that they could still be his people. They saw the, the t- tabernacle in the temple where God would come and dwell with his people in a building. And yet they saw has, how over and over again Israel rejected this God. But then they saw Jesus, the only hope for people, leave heaven and come as a man. But they saw that even then he came to his own people and his own people rejected him. People despised God in the flesh. And they watched as he was nailed to the cross and, and p- paid the penalty for, for sin. He was um, rejected by God. On the cross, he chose to be forsaken. But then they rejoiced at the fact that he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead to give new life to sinful people, to overcome death and sin. He broke the chains of sin and death. And God's plan to redeem was finally accomplished. The price had been paid for sin. And so now angels see that sinful people, sinners, can become saints. Enemies of God can become his friends. Spiritual orphans, apart from God, are now made God's children through faith in Jesus Christ. And this is why we are now told that there is joy in the angels in God's presence over one sinner that repents. We understand it makes sense that angels see how much joy that God has in the fact that sinful people are now embracing his mercy for them. Guilty sinners are embracing the God who sent his son to give them mercy. And there is, they see that, that joy in God's presence and they as a result have joy with him. But here's the thing. Angels can never experience this great gift of mercy and salvation but we get to. They can only watch from a distance and imagine how great it feels to know that God loves us in such a way that he would lay down his life for us and make us new and forgiven. And that is what every person is offered through Jesus Christ. And so even as we think about trials that we're facing, the difficult life, those things don't seem so difficult when we know all that God has already done for us through Jesus Christ. And so Peter's point is this. Listen, if angels get excited about our salvation, how much more should we, who actually get to experience it, be excited about it and be joyful in it? If angels love to work at the look at the work that God is doing in saving sinners, how much more should us who have sinned against God and and yet have been saved have joy? in what God has done in our life. There's nothing that can override the joy of what God offers us. And so Peter tells us that we can rejoice even in suffering grief in the midst of trials. But Peter also tells us God wants this for you. God wants you to experience this joy. But for us to have that, But for us right now, in the trials that we're facing, to have joy, some things have to happen. First, we have to personally know how big God is. We have to come to grips with the fact that that God is sovereign over all things. We also have to personally know the heights of his love for us and the, the, the lengths that he was willing to go to show his love for us. And then we have to know that the detailed ways that he cares for us 
even in the midst of trials. The good that he is bringing, the details that he doesn't ignore to bring good. So when you lack joy in your life, even in difficulty, we have to stop and acknowledge, I'm not joyful in my life right now for for one of two reasons. Either I don't know the joy of Christ in my life, or I have forgotten the gospel. I have forgotten the good news of what he's done for me. Either I don't know it at all, I've never really experienced God's mercy and love for me, or I've forgotten it. And all you have to do is stop in that moment and look and think on and revisit cavalry. At cavalry, we can meditate on God's goodness towards us and the ultimate link that he went in Jesus giving himself for us. This puts life in perspective. In the gospel, Jesus giving his life to buy our forgiveness, sinners, sinners, rebels against God, there is a joy that puts every season in proper perspective. Even trials where we're being quarantined by the coronavirus. So if you want lasting and true joy, remember this. It is ultimately not the removal of trials that brings joy, but it is the presence of Christ in the trials that brings the joy we long for. Do you know this presence? Do you have this presence of Jesus in your life and know that he is bringing joy even in the trials you're facing? This is what he offers to you today. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you love us enough to give us an opportunity to know joy in Christ, even in the most desperate situations of this life. Lord, that you would send your son from heaven, that we might have joy. That we might know that there is a greater joy than any struggle we face. Yes, we know, and you know, Father, that trials are hard. There's weeping, there's tears, and there's hurt, and there's struggle in this life. But we know that we do not live out those things without hope and joy when we have Christ in our life. That even in the midst of those, there is something more that you offer to us. And we cling to that. Father, I pray for all of us listening today that we would cling to the joy of Christ. And that trials would only serve to cause us to run to you even more. That we may be reminded and know your joy. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we have a time now of responding to God's word, we like to respond to God's word by singing and taking a time to reflect on what he has revealed to us. So let me encourage you, as you're watching from home or wherever you may be watching, to take some time to reflect on the truths of God's word today, of the joy that he offers you in the presence of Christ. For some of us, this may mean, well, we need to come to know Christ like we never have before. We've never really trusted Christ. We've never invited him into our lives, and so we don't know his joy. Well, God is, uh, is calling you today to acknowledge your sin before him, to acknowledge your need for his forgiveness, a perfect God who never sinned. In In order to be brought into his presence, we must be forgiven of our sin. And Jesus paid the price so that you can be forgiven And you can know God's presence and the joy that that presence brings. Give your life to Jesus today. We would love to talk with you about that or or talk with you on the phone or you can email us or call us. And we would love to introduce you to the Savior. Or maybe some of you all have just not been walking in the presence of Christ. As a result, you've been missing out on that joy. When God is calling for you to, to take that a little bit more seriously. To spend time gazing on Christ and his glories and his mercies and his grace. And know that as you do that, God applies that to your heart and brings joy to you. And God is offering you a chance to to do that anew today. So let's sing, let's respond to God's word in the way that he's calling uh, us to. If you would like to to give and support the work that we're continuing to to do um, for God through this church, you can give online or you can write a check and mail it in. We would love to to partner with you in in the work and the ministry that he's continuing to do. Even though we can't meet in person like we normally do, God is still at work. God is still using this church uh, to do ministry here in our community and beyond, and we want to be a part of that. 
So let's sing together and rejoice in these great truths that we have seen. As we close out our time of worship online here together, I just want to mention a couple things. First, uh, mark on your calendars on Mother's Day, which is two weeks from now, May 10th. We are going to have another drive-in service here at the church property. Uh, I know many of you all enjoyed being able to come on Easter and, and at least seeing each other's faces through your cars. 
And so we're going to try to do that again on Mother's Day and and look forward to, to seeing you all here on the property together. We'll still continue to maintain the the guidelines for social distancing and make sure everyone is kept safe. And so looking forward to that. Also just want to encourage you all to to continue to minister to one another. Uh, think about the people you know here in our church family and just pick up the phone this week and make some phone calls and check in with people and see how they're doing, see how you can pray for one another um, and how you can minister, minister to and encourage each other. So let me just close out um, with Psalm 30. And I want us to just think about this, this psalm and, and my prayer is that we would know this reality in our lives today. Psalm 30, verses 11 and 12 says this, You turned my lament, you turned my sadness into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness so that I can sing to you and not be silent. Lord my God, I will praise you forever. And this is what the reality of the gospel of Christ brings to us. We know that God can take any sadness and give us a heart of gladness and praise and joy, and we cannot be silent. And so may we experience God in, this, in a way this week that we have joy, and that joy overflows, and we can't help but speak of it and sing His praises. Thank you for worshiping with us. I hope you all have a great day and a great rest of the week ahead.